Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and let's start for today's um, November 11th um, Asian Philosophies. So let's go our schedule. Okay, so uh, today our subject is significance of Taoism, and then that's the in serve as an introduction part of the book. We go through uh, basics. That's a formula it's translation from uh, Zhuangzi, the Taoist uh, uh, philosophy or philosophers, uh, the inner chapter from book uh, chapter one to chapter seven, and that's the introduction. Just as I said before, uh, I I like to read the introduction last. So when we run through all seven chapters, I think that's the time to talk about uh, uh, introduction. And the formula lists the 10 uh, significant points about the Taoist philosophy. So that's this week. And the next week, uh, Kuang is going to talk about this uh, great disunion. And the basics, I believe he's focused on the northern part of China. And about last year, around the same time, I talk about this period. But my focus is on the south, south part of China, which is popular about Taoism, okay, near Taoism. So uh, that's why you can see the different interest between Kuang and me. Kuang probably more interested in the uh, Confucianism, okay, this kind. And I'm more interested in the Taoism. So I focus on the South part and he focus on the North part. So uh, I, everyone will have the uh, chance to see different view. Then we take one week off on the Thanksgiving and then I will come back to talk about a few stories from Zhuangzi, this book, because Zhuangzi always have a lot of stories. And we don't know exactly how many stories, but at least hundreds of different stories. But I, there's some stories are very famous. And then I would like to uh, go over about uh, six or seven stories. And if you know some story or you overheard some story you want me to cover, then uh, please let me know, you know, send message to me and I will try to include in the December 2nd uh, presentation. And December 9th, we'll continue on the journey for the Bhagavad Gita and the Sash is going to finish chapter 10, okay, with some exercise I will post on the uh, uh, meetup page. And the, the last section of this year, uh, December 16th, uh, CK, uh, maybe he is not here, but you know, uh, CK, are you here? No. Okay. So anyway, CK is going to make a presentation about a uh, different subject, which I probably not able to cover about uh, art, uh, Chinese painting, a uh, famous painter or Chinese uh, painter, uh, Gu Hongmin. Okay. So he is going to have a presentation on uh, December 16th, and then we'll take off for the uh, 2023 and 2024, we will restart probably around 13. And then uh, Steve will start his presentation about Go. And then we will move on. So that's our schedule. And then uh, any question, comment, and what you want to cover? OK, so this is the book. Uh, recover okay and uh, Feng Yolan I have been interested about him and the next year I'm going to introduce his another book called a history of Chinese philosophy okay so I will go through chapter by chapter uh, the same author and uh, this year we go through this seven chapter Zhuangzi okay, uh, translation so uh, today you can see if you can see as the last section if you have been through with this meetup okay, for seven chapter, and then you can see this one as a first section because that's the introduction part. After you go through this one, if you find interest, and you are welcome to watch the uh, playlist in the YouTube. I will post the uh, link uh, to the chat so you can uh, watch it. Uh, Madeline, please. Yes, uh, thanks, Jason. I just have a question. Um, the uh, the Feng Yulan, uh history of Chinese philosophy. 
Mm -hmm. I would be happy if we use the same book as before, but I don't know we're going to be using the two volume one now or I think I will use two volume one. Okay. I think I will use the two volume one and will compare with the uh the, the old one. Okay. So that that's pretty sweet. I probably would do it because I think the two volume one probably too difficult, too technical. Okay. So what I will do is I will because the two the two volume one is has more stuff. Okay, so I will cover. Uh, you can see us this the old one plus something. That, that's the way I try to do. I haven't okay. figured out what would be the best way, but that's the idea I'm thinking. You know, because uh, I definitely I can go through one more time, and then that's my original idea. But I may use the uh, the, the the two volume one as a foundation, or I may use the old one the simple one, short history as a foundation and use the other one as a reference. I haven't decided yet, but I have to look at the context. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, so that, that could be take two years, I think. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, we take one and a half years to read the uh, history, uh, uh, a short history. <laughs> so, but anyway, that's the, uh, uh, the plan, you know, but anyway, uh, the idea is every section I consider as semi-independent. So I call it uh, uh, philosophy 101, Chinese philosophy 101 or Chinese philosophy and plus uh, 201. So if you are the first time, I think you should be able to understand. At least you get most of uh, uh, the contents. If you have been through for a long time, and I believe you will get more things, you know, uh, or you, you can share what you know. So before I start, and then uh, I, I'd like to know, is anyone read the uh, introduction and you want to share what you get, or you want to me to, or you a certain uh, area, you want to have a further discussion? And any anyone willing to share or anyone willing to uh, share what 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 you see on the uh, introduction part? Uh, Klim, please. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I have one note um, on the introduction, uh, <clears throat> and that has to do with uh, I think the on the last page of the introduction where the author brings Hegel into the picture yeah, yeah. and mentions this particular phrase, uh, the labor and culture of the spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then also there's this term, second harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that sort of um, led me, led me to think further and, and perhaps beyond the classical boundaries of what, what we perceive to be the the Taoist uh, philosophy uh, because I think there's an attempt there to merge the two tendency one the sort of the um the tendency to, towards the natural state uh towards the the peace the harmony the what is perceived to be the original harmony the, the harmony of the child without knowing things right and then the after a person grows up goes through the all sorts of the experiences of life matures uh somehow and then kind of reachieves the similar state um mm -hmm. but as it is pointed out that the second second harmony is while it's somewhat similar to the child's the harmony of a child it's also a different different state now my comment to that is that i'm not i'm not 100 percent while it is this true i'm not sure if theoretically i would 100 percent agree with that mm -hmm. because again from speaking from the taoist uh perspective it almost when when reading the, this whole introduction almost there 
uh, doesn't seem to be a place for anything that's not natural. In in other words, let's let's compare this to uh, an ocean or a sea. You know, yes, we all like the, the serenity of of the ocean, the beautiful views, the sunset, and and so on. But then, if we think about the ocean that's in the state of storm and chaos, well, it would it would wouldn't seem to be unnatural from the Taoist philosophy as well. So, so anything, let's, let's compare that to the state of war or, um, the, the, you know, the disconnect, the, the strife, um, all sort development of so, all sorts of concept development of knowledge by the human society. Wouldn't that be also natural? Okay, so yeah. that's so that's 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 my point. I'm glad that you bring up this one, and then uh, I I I I like this part, and I totally agree with the author. So uh, let's talk this one uh, to the end because that's the last page, and I I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about this part. I think that's important. Uh, personal, I I feel that's important, and I okay, we 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 can discuss more to the end. Thank you for sharing. Anyone has anything about what you read you want to share? Okay, so here I'm going to just briefly you know, go through what we have. Seven chapters, right? From the happy excursion or the, uh, the equality of steam, the third one fundamental for cultivation of life, human world, Evidence of virtue, that's uh, Zhuangzi's uh, moral theory, then the great master uh, teacher, which is his religious view. Okay, and the last one is his political view. So it makes the seven chapter as the complete philosophy for Zhuangzi. So Zhuangzi as a book and also as a person, at least here, okay, usually I separate Zhuangzi means that's the person or Zhuangzhou, that's his name. And if I put the spelling together, usually means the book. So that's the way I uh, uh, separate that. So this book have a 33 chapter and we only cover one to seven. And then uh, the rate, usually believe, we believe one to seven is written by Zhuangzi himself. And the outer chapter from eight to 22 is written by his disciple. And the 23rd to 33, uh, we believe, is written by later scholar. Okay. So that's the, uh, yeah, but all these 33 uh, combined together, we call Zhuangzi as a book. And here, uh, the Feng Yulan translation it cover one to seven. So that's, uh, we go through most of time this year from one to seven. So quickly, I just go through the book at long time uh, produced uh, 3300 BC. So it's about 200 years after Confucius, 2300 years ago. Okay, that's the idea. And a lot of commentary and then a lot of translation. So I make, I'm not going to go through this one because I show every week and then I will have the PDF file post on the internet and uh, you can see this part. And personally, I think my organize, I organize on each chapter, I put the breakdown or structure of this one. I think that's uh, my, my invention, let's put it this way. I don't see anybody do this way. And, and I find out using this way, you, will, you can read Zhuangzi in a more Productive way or organized way. That's I think. So, uh, Alex, you have a uh, comment, please. Yeah, actually, just a quick question. Um, is there a free version of this book online? Because I actually, um, yeah, I didn't get to read yeah. the book. It's uh, you look at the uh, 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 my the web the, the page. I have the link. Oh, okay. So there I'm, is. Okay, thank but, you. But. But strongly recommend to buy it for to buy it. But <laughs> oh, anyway, um, okay. So just uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I want to I want to go through the the 
I guess the the meet up with you and see if I want to buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the actually, actually, it's it is a very good book. I have one. Okay, so it's it's a very okay. very very good one. Okay, so uh, I put the, each one. I put a summary. Okay, and then I'm not going through, but uh, that's I try to organize on each chapter, and then I think it will help you. That's the way I understand all this one, chapter five and chapter six. Each week I work on you know each chapter to chapter seven. Okay, so let's start from here. That's the beginning, and then Feng Yolan, the author, he start with uh uh so called he called a two world view. Okay, so um basically he's talking about the Taoist world view. Okay, so he's Feng Yolan, the author. I uh first thing I like to mention is when we put the when I put the blue color, that means uh, I think that's a specific uh, Feng Yolan's opinion. Okay, so uh, if I put the purple, okay, that means uh, Jason my, myself. That's uh, my opinion. So here is Feng Yolan's copy. So basically, he's talking about the history of philosophy. Generally speaking, there are many two ways to consolidate the, the point of view view that he talked about uh, we all face the science view and the uh, uh, religious view okay so see and uh, then uh, interesting is he see Feng Yolan see how philosophy philosophers see this world in two different ways one way he called pragmatic and another one he called neo neo realistic view uh, I know probably a lot of people would disagree or say that's a strange, but let's forget about this. Let's try to understand uh, how Feng Yolan analyzed this thing. And it take me like a few, a, read a few times to understand why he is talking about this. He put the pragmatic view, including Kent, Okay, because Kant look at the phenomenal world and the numenal world. And then he also includes William James, Henry Parson, and that all these people, because I it would be a little bit strange to put the Kant and the person and William James together. But from your line's point of view is for these people, Kant, James, person, they see this world as dualistic world. They have they all have the uh, uh, science world, they have the religious world. Okay, science world is all the science, the deter deterministic world. And the, the other world is you can call it the spiritual world, religious world, or you call it human. They have the soul, God, uh, freedom, you know, all these kind of things. So that's a dualistic world. That's Feng Yolan's understanding and he said that they have another kind of philosopher he used example is spinoza uh, as you know spinoza is famous as his uh, 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 moni, mon, monism point of view okay so he see everything is one okay substance that's god so in Feng Yolan's point of view is uh Zhuangzi, the Taoism thinking, is the naturalistic and the science, and the the, uh, the other okay, uh, the other world is mystic and the religion. In Zhuangzi point of view, he has two uh, view together. All right, so that's Feng Yulan's assessment about. Taoist worldview. So that's the part. Uh, I think it's a little bit strange and then a little bit hard to uh, uh, go through this one. But I just like, I think that's important, you know, uh, to share. That's why I put it here. Okay. So uh, before I go through, and uh, any comment or uh, question on this part? I know there's often a distinction made between philosophical Taoism and religious Taoism. 
Is that the distinction they're talking about here, or are no, they? No, no, no. So, thank you to bring up this one. Okay, so all this one are talking about philosophical. Okay, not religious Taoism, because uh, that's what I religious yeah. Taoism is. I, I will talk about this a little bit later because uh, that's. Uh, thank you to bring up this one. Okay, so yeah, I think that's important when. Uh, formula and talk about religious. He is not talking about religious Taoism. Okay. He talking about the theology point of view. So, uh, uh, more about uh, metaphysics when he talk about religious. So, uh, formula and write this one. Okay. Uh, let me read it. Among the Tao, Tao, uh, among the Taoist uh, classic, Zhuangzi book, this book, I, I put a purple, I, I like the new spelling, uh, Zhuangzi, and formula line use the old spelling, this one. So please note it, they are the same words, same meaning. It's not only instructive, but also interesting. Zhuangzi was not only a philosopher, but also a poet. His philosophy is like that of Spinoza. His style is like that of Plato. Uh, I put a quote here. I think he meant, a uh, formula means like Plato because he think about like a Platonic dialogue. And I don't see Zhuangzi's philosophy has any similarity to Plato's. And I add uh, the uh, Nietzsche's, the spoke, the, sp the spoke Zarathustra, because I think uh, Zhuangzi's style is very similar to Nietzsche's style, especially uh, the spoke uh, Zarathustra. That's my opinion. And he expounded the the various abstract principle of Spinoza with concrete illustration and poetic expression. So uh, I, I I I put this quote here is I just like to share uh, what I how do I prepare. Uh, these seven chapters. Uh, I list a few names here, and then I just want to let everyone know there's many, many ways to read Zhuangzi. And number one, uh, Feng Yulan, okay, the way basically he was trained in uh, Colombia, and he was the student of Zhang Dui, and they went, to, went back to China, and they, you know, so he has a very fun solid Chinese literature, philosophy, a classic background, and he learned Western philosophy, and then he do the translation. So his point of view is more on the Western philosophy point of view. That's the one I use for one. And they have another reading, just like Steve talked about. I also uh, uh, watch some of his uh, uh, video, his contemporary, uh, uh, Guo Ming Yi. He is a, a kind of a lecture in the religion called Yi Guan Dao. Okay, that's a religious kind of associate with Tao, uh, religious Tao and uh, some Buddhism. You know, uh, a, a few of my friends is a, a dedicated believer of the Yi Guan Dao. And uh, they, uh, they like Guo Ming Yi. Okay, his lecture basics, the basic is talking about Zhuangzi, but from the religious point of view. And the, the other four people, you can see they all professor from NTU, which is National Taiwan University. And the, the, in, you can see the same book uh, in the National Taiwan University. They have many professors teaching at the same time. And then they are from the different point of view. For example, Cai Biming, oh, unfortunately, they probably only have the Chinese uh, version, and uh, there's no English version. Uh, Cai Biming, he, he, she, 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 her point basically is about maintaining a good health, traditional medicine, this point of view, you know, how to take care of yourself, how to live a good life, that's the way she teach. Du Bao Rei, that's another young, Uh, lecture of a professor. Uh, I think he's in China now. Uh, he is totally from the fundamental Chinese philosophy point of view to read this one. I follow him a lot because he helped me understand a lot of uh, texts. And this one, Jin Jia Xi, that's another very interesting professor. He's 
probably over 80 years old, and uh, that he taught as a uh, literature. Okay, so he read this one as a literature. So that's a different way to read. Fu Pei Rong, uh, Professor Fu, he is reading this one as a Chinese classic. I didn't follow him a lot, but basically I follow him because he, most of his uh, studies about Confucianism, but he also teach Taoism, uh, uh, teach Zhuangzi at the same time. So I just list the uh, reference I use, and you will see uh, uh, if you are interested, you know, after uh, 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 during this meetup, and uh, you want to do your own reading, and you want to pull out some uh, 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 YouTube video, you know, to learn something, you may surprise, you know, there's many, many different ways uh, to read this text. And if you know Chinese, you will find out the text itself, uh, you can read as a literature, and a lot of people read as a literature. So, uh, that, that that's how uh, uh, they have a different way to read this text. So, okay, so that's the reference and the... Okay, so I list the 10 point here. That's uh, Fong Yolan list the 10 point. And I think Okay, here, let me put the this one in the chat. So this one on the bottom I put here is the, uh, let me see where is the chat. So I put the, I kind of organize all this one together and then so uh, uh, that's the playlist in YouTube. So if you are interested, you can you know, go ahead to uh, uh, watch. So uh, before I go into the 10 point, and then uh, if you have any question, uh, Steve, please. Yeah, you were uh, talking about the very many ways to, to approach the Chuangzi stories. I don't know if you'll find this interesting or apocryphal, but uh, I have a it, because most of his his you know, most of his writings are stories. They're literal stories. You know, this happened and there's lessons behind it. I have a book of um, cartoons, manga, essentially oh. that are Chuangzi's stories. I used to use that with my read them to my kids when they were little. So there's yet another way to enjoy Zhuangzi. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's on point, you know, it's, it's telling the stories just as he did. And uh, another entertain, entertaining way to read it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I it's hard to say it's a, a, a good way or not good way, good way, right? right? Depend on how you want to achieve it. And that, that's a lot of uh, a cartoon version of Zhuangzi since they have a lot of story. And they, I know in, uh, Taiwan, I saw a lot of uh, this kind of book because well, one one reason is uh, uh, that that easy that's an easy sale, so uh, that, that that would be the good one to start it to read it. And if you know the English version, and then uh, if Steve, you can post on the uh, chat, so you know, we, we we can share, or you can share with me, and I'm also interested to. I'll, I'll grab it off the shelf over here and maybe yeah, that'd be, that'd down be, the title and author. Yeah, that that'll be that be great. I also interested to see it. But again, watch a video, uh, read the original, read the translation. They all had a different experience, and then I would not say they all equal. Uh, Alex, please. Yeah, actually, I also want to recommend a book that's actually really popular in America. Uh, it's called The Tao of Pooh. Have you heard of this book before oh. by uh, Benjamin Hoff? And no. I, I've been reading it and it's it's a really fun book and it's a really kind of an easy way to get into to 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 Taoism. And um yeah, that's you know there's also the the day of the the day of Piglet. Right, right. I think <laughs> two books are really fun, yeah. Okay. And so, actually, actually, they have you know very. It's kind of a good entry point to kind of get into Tao because you know it's written from like a very 
kind of um 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 you know from Winnie the Pooh, you know, the dialogue between Winnie the Pooh and the author and 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 and, and Winnie the Pooh's friends, you know, they were talking about Dao, and it's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for sharing this. Uh, actually, um, uh, what's that? Um, December 2nd. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few stories and about, I, I think I pick up six famous story to share and then you can put in the chat if you heard of overheard or you thought that they have some story interested, uh, please let me know. Okay, so I will try to include it. Because they have many, many stories, just like Steve talk about the cartoon, talk about many stories. And then I'm going to pick up the famous one and then we'll share the original of uh, the word by word the translation. Because if you do it in a cartoon and they do it in uh, video or something, you may lose some uh, 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 insight. So I will show the original Chinese text and uh, with the direct translation. So we will have a better understanding of what the, and we can follow by uh, a few discussion and what we can. So kind of like exercise. So uh, December 2nd, that's what I'm going to do. So uh, I'm going to, for the 10 section, uh, the 10 uh, point uh, about uh, Feng Yolan, uh, summarize. Okay. So I will say this 10, okay, uh, let me show here. It's 10 point. 10 point, I will say from one to six is in the book, okay, kind of, uh, it's common uh, understanding about Zhuangzi's philosophy. Seven, eight, nine, and the 10, I believe that's Feng Yolan's opinion. And then we will see you know, how you see this one. Okay. So first, Tao and the De. Okay. So Feng Yolan, I, I summarize a few points. I think that's important. But if I miss something, and then you are welcome to uh, share. So first, he talking about Tao is something, is not something transcendent in the world. It is the world. It is everywhere. It is the whole. I think that's important because if you read the Confucius or Analects, you will know Confucius also talk about Tao a lot. And are they talking about the same Tao or different Tao? Uh, the point here, Feng Yolan point out, Tao is, Tao is not transcendent in the world. It's the world. And the Confucius Tao is generally speaking translate as the way that means uh, an instrument instrument is use the Tao to use the Tao as a means to go to the higher purpose, which is benevolence or Ren. So that's the general difference between Confucians talking about Tao and the Taoists talking about Tao. That's the difference. So uh, in the chapter two, and also talking about the totality of the spontaneity of all things called Tao, and Tao is everywhere. So chapter six, which talk about the uh, religious and talk about the uh, doing everything by doing nothing. And if you are familiar, that's called Wu Wei, okay, non-action. Basic is talking about Tao's function. So Again, he talk about Tao. He talk about nothing. It's not equal to zero. It's the totality of everything. So uh, I think that's a very important concept between nothing or emptiness, because uh, uh, a lot of uh, translation or interpreter, including Chinese interpretation, uh, were kind of mixed with Tao is a nothing or emptiness with Buddhism, nothing and emptiness. They have the subtle difference and then it's very difficult to separate them. But we need to separate if you are reading Taoism as a philosophy because when Zhuangzi or Lao Tzu writing his, their philosophies, Buddhism is not there. What Buddhism happened in India, but they have 
they know nothing about Buddhism. So the, that's the two different concepts. But it's very difficult for us, 2,300 years later, to separate these two concepts. But I just want to point out that that's an important difference. So uh, uh, another point is that Taoism destroyed the popular and the religious concept of God. So important thing is even we talk about they have the religious Tao. Okay. A religious Tao, they have the gods, the many, many different gods. Let's forget about religious Tao. Let's talk about philosophical Tao. And Steve asked the question about the metaphysical God. It doesn't have God, concept of God. So that's important in the uh, philosophical Tao. There's no God here, unlike Western philosophy, when Plato or later the, even the Enlightenment philosopher, the God always have their own position, right? Even in Kant, yeah, it's God. He also talk about God. All the philosophers talk about, even William James when he talk about God. Uh, so uh, in the Taoism, basic, there's no concept of God. And then there's no concept of God as a creator. So in this point of view, the Taoism is naturalistic uh, philosophy. So that's about the Tao. And the second thing is the also important. So the is what an individual thing receives from Tao. So in this point of view, it is interesting to separate the the concept, uh, this word the, right? Usually we translate as virtue. But in Taoism, this the, this word the basics is, you can say it's a moral, is more on the more individual capability. So I have my own the, and you have your own the. That, that's no, it's individualized. Unlike Confucianism, they will talk about they have the common virtue we all need to follow. <laughs> that's the difference. And then here, uh, uh, Feng Yulan used a good uh, metaphor. He talked about between the and the Tao, right? It's just like between water in the river or lake. That's the. And if you talk about water in general or water itself, you can say that's Tao. Okay, so that's the difference. And I like to quote on the Tao Te Ching, which is produced 200 years before uh, Zhuangzi, and the Tao give the life, the raise them and matter give them space, condition. Sometimes we translate as shi, it's, it's another concept, a complete for them. Okay, so basics, the Tao, Tao Te Ching is talking about Tao, the matter, and the condition. That's the totality of this world. There's no place for God. So that's the uh, first concept uh, Feng Yulan point out. So sleep, please. Uh, just a question. I don't. I never made this connection before because I probably have never heard "de" pre pronounced mm -hmm. correctly. In the title "Dao de Ching," is that "Dao" and the same "de"? Is, yes. is that the same? Yes, that's a Dao. Oh, I never made that connection before. Yeah, okay. That's a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, 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 Frank, please. B S H I here. Is that the same? As C X I in English, which one? This one? Yes. Uh, no. Okay, this one. Uh, you are not in the uh, art of war reading, right? So, uh, right. Uh, I refer to that. art of war. Uh, use this word a lot called shi. Okay. Uh, there's many many translation, and then uh, we probably need to talk a lot of spend a lot of time to explain this concept. Basically, you can say that's the situation, that's something, the, 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 the trend, okay? So there's many, many ways to talk about, about this one, but it's not xi, it's not qi, it's not, it's shi, okay, pronounced as shi. If you read uh, Art of War, 
if you read the Chinese legal reason, Han Fei Zi, this word is important because you are occupy certain position. Okay, that's called Si. If you put a, a, a rock on the mountain, right? On the mountain, mountain top, that's the Si. You are in that position. You just release the rock will fall down. That's a powerful. So that's kind of concept. And oh, then yeah. I okay. believe uh, Steve, Steve, when you talk about Go, I don't know, do you use the concept of Si? Mm, no, I do not. Okay, so when my grandpa taught me, they talk about si. Okay, when you lay out, and then and that's the si. Okay, that's important. So you have to make sure. Because how, in, when you play go, how do I know you are winning and losing without detailed calculation? Okay, you just look at the si, okay, the situation potential okay so that, that's my grandpa told me so <laughs> that's interesting yeah we most of the vocabulary we use is japanese so i, yeah, I don't know as many me, chinese terms uh no my my because i'm from taiwan basics they all trend in the japanese way so uh but basics i was told like don't look at the small area you know this piece this piece look at the si, okay then <laughs> I, I now I understand exactly what she means. You you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, yes. great. So okay. So uh so since we talk about Tao and De, that's the most important thing in the uh uh Taoism philosophy. So second part we are talking about is theory of Latin law. And I will call this one is uh Taoist uh is both for uh, Zhuangzi and uh, Laozi, Dao De Jing, uh, that's important political theory, which is Latin law. So that's very important. And then uh, uh, the proper way would be called Wu Wei, non action. And then if you want to, in today's world, we will call it uh, less interference. Okay, don't interfere too much. <coughs> so the theory is this, everything has its own the, okay, the virtue. Remember, that's a different than Confucius thinking. Confucian would say, we have a common the, okay, a few things that we need to follow. Then that's the society. We will have a stable, harmonized society. That's a Confucius thinking. But Taoism thinking would be different. They say, it, they think everyone, everything has its own the, or you want to translate as a virtue. So everything has its own proper nature. Everything is happy. Follow its nature, it's happy. If it's allowed to be in accordance with its own nature, it will be happy. So though there is a great difference between these two, okay? So here, Fuller is talking about in chapter one, okay? Uh, just the story about the big birds, small birds, okay. So the nature has seen very different. Big bird, you know, you can fly from the North Pole to the South Pole, but the small bird, when they fly, it's just only like, you know, one feet. And they think I fly long, long. So they all very different. And then uh, both are happy. So that's they want to prove, okay, everything, has its own virtue. They do their own. So every modification of nature is the cause of pain and the suffering. And this concept even important today when we talk about environment, right? You change the nature. Uh, most people will modify the nature and the, even their intention may be good, but what they consider to be good may not be considered good by others. So I probably will include this story on the chapter 18. So base, they have many, many stories, you know, my own good, I think your own good. I think everyone probably can think about uh, this kind of case, right? But chapter 18, they talk about uh, seabirds, okay, so flew to an inland and the people want to treat the seabird very well. They have a good intention, but eventually you kill the sea, sea god, right? Uh, Richard, do you have a question or comment? 
Yeah, um, I'm wondering why um, there's a separation between Tao and Te because uh, it's it's one thing. The being is the doing. The doing is the being. It's it's one movement. It's not like separate. Um, you can't ex you can't separate the expression of Tao from the Tao itself. The Tao uh, is operating. The Tao is moving, acting. So I don't know to give it a word. Another word is to cause some kind of like separation. It's like a mental thing. It's one thing. In truth, the Tao is Te, and Te is Tao. It's the same. It's okay. one movement. Thank, thank you for uh, your sharing, and I totally respect your idea, and I have nothing to uh, argue against it. Okay, I just have to say, uh, that's the the way uh, uh, Lao Tzu doing this way, and the, the, the first, uh, how many chapter? 40 chapter, uh, 37 chapter, is called, basically talking about Tao, and the, the second part talking about De, and the formula make the metaphor. Tao is kind of like water, the is like river, water in the river, set the some guidance, and the Tao is common for everyone. The is a sacred, different person, you and me, bird, uh, monkey, they all have a different the. That's the concept. If you think, oh, they should be the same, yeah, uh, some people may think this. Yeah. Uh, Krim, please. I was actually thinking about the distinction between uh, Tao and Te, just like Richard. And I also see Robert also gave a comment in, in the chat. Um, so would that be too much of a stretch to compare that to, to as an analogy, maybe not a perfect analogy, but to compare that uh, sort of to the, to the Hinduist distinction between Brahman and Atman, where Te may be viewed as a sort of like an individualized uh, Tao that, you know, maybe like a conditioned one, but the, having the same nature. Yeah, I, I, I do think in this way. You know, I do think about it. I see the as like a Brahman, okay? And then, you know, and then uh, 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 Tao, Tao kind of like a, a Brahman and then the kind of uh, uh, Atma, individual Atma. Uh, it's, but it's a, a slightly different, but I do see uh, 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 this one. But again, uh, this one basics is uh, important thing is you may, when you read this one, you learn this one, important thing is not you accept what the text said, it's not you agree with Jason, me, say, okay, I think the important thing is you have your own question. I think that's, and then you have your own opinion. I think that's my purpose, and that's probably the uh, highest way of learning. That's what I see. So we have a Quan and uh, Key. Yes, Kwan. I, I, yes, I think that the rapprochement with uh, Brahman and the concept of Tao is very interesting. If you think that Brahman in Sanskrit mean means infinite, okay. Yeah. So in the concept of Tao, you have that undertone of infinite, formless, and a noumenal uh, reality. And the sometimes is translated not as a virtue, but as power. So it's a part of that infinite that is uh, embodied in a certain definite power, a definite form, if you want. And maybe here maybe is a little bit far-fetched, but once again, we can go back to the timeless form of Plato, which is infinite, and the specific forms in phenomenal reality or phenomena. Or phenomena. I stop here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kwam. Yeah, I think that will be my uh, later part. I, I will talk about this one because Fong Yulan also talk about this concept, the, infin uh, uh, the, 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 the infinite is expressed in uh, the finite. So you know the 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 the, the eternal express in the temple. So this kind of concept. Uh, thank you for sharing. So let me move on to the third part. Okay. So here I put the, again I uh, I put the red text. That means Guo Xiang. 
Guoxiang is on the second century, which is about 500 years uh, after Zhuangzi, and he is a great commentator. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, Zhuangzi, com he compiled Zhuangzi and they put a lot of comment on that. So uh, that's why I try to separate different um, people. That's why you, 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 it, it's welcome to everyone disagree, have a different opinion, because through the history, everybody have a different opinion. So I try to put a different color to show that different person uh, comment. So here I put the red, that means Guo Xiang's comment. So we talk about Tao and the De, and then we talk about the Latin law. Okay, that's the political view. So the same political view you can apply is on personal life, right? How are you going to live the personal life? So that comes with another important concept in uh, uh, Zhuangzi. That's how the art of living, right? The, the, so basically we always in the place of safety and then, uh, let me see. Okay, let's read the Guo Xiang's comment on this one. A uh, perfect man is kind of like, if you want to compare with Confucian, Junzi, the gentleman, okay, so kind of the moral, the ideal situation. So he talked about important thing is the, per the perfect man is useless to others, and but everything is use useful to itself. So here, the perfect man is free from harm of human world and always receive the real benefit. This is who is aqua in his virtue. That's uh, Guo Xiang's comment. So he further, he talked about let your knowledge stop. Okay, that's how you live, which will be very different than Confucian or most of people thinking about knowledge. So he talked about let your knowledge stop at what you do not know. Let your ability to stop at what you cannot do. Use what is naturally useful to what you spontaneously can do. Act according to your will within the limits of your nature, but have nothing to do with what, what is beyond it. So if you think through this one, uh, I just don't, at least I don't read this way like, oh, I just be lazy. I, 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 I don't study because I know, I know, I don't know, I don't know. But basics, he try to tell you a attitude. You study, you do something, but you make sure do it within your own limit. Okay. So you may ask, like, challenge yourself. Okay. Uh, the sky is the limit. So that's not the concept Zhuangzi or Taoist want to say, okay? Uh, how to challenge yourself? That's another big question, right? But his point, Zhuangzi and Guo Xiang, or the Taoist point is you only can learn and you should know where to stop learning. Okay? To the point, you need to know how to stop, where to stop. When you act, you only to, you have to know what's your limit. Don't go over. Don't go over is not only bad for you and also bad for the world, to, the, to this world, because what you think is good may not be good for other people. Just like before, we think we can, let's, let's say 100 years ago, I remember when I was in primary school, I remember the textbook to teach us the resources of Earth is unlimited. So what we have explored today is ju just like the skin, uh, just like the skin of the apple. So the, when I was there, I, of course, that's like 50 years ago, uh, the teacher tried to teach me you should explore, okay, abuse, or try to take all the advantage of the natural resources. But today we have a different concept. We should preserve, we should uh, uh, don't go, don't abuse the natural resources. 
So I think this kind of concept is Zhuangzi or Taoism try to say, you, know, you don't go to extreme and you should always do it within the limit. I think that's the thing. Uh, at least I, I learned this way. So after this one, we will go to the next one is nature flow because when you talk about how to live, then you need some uh, uh, theoretical foundation. And basically this concept equality of thing is basic in Zhuangzi's chapter two. Right? Basically he talk about, uh, I think the important thing is uh, although there are infinite number of difference between things in different aspects you are, but all are right and the good. So <clears throat> the different opinion, same as the different opinion in the human world. So there will be uh, in the chapter two, okay, and Zhuangzi is talking about the story about all these different noises. Okay, he talk about the noise of heaven, noise of earth, that's the natural uh, uh, noise, and the noise or music of men. They all different way. So in Zhuangzi's opinion, human world is not only the degree different from the birth noise. So you have your opinion, I have my own opinion, and then the, he called it the music of men. They are equally right and the good. There's no good or wrong, just like the birds singing, the wind blowing, you hear the noise or you want to call it the music. There's nothing so-called good or bad or beautiful or ugly. So that's in Zhuang's point of view, he wants to talk about the equality of things. So things are equal, big birds, small birds, monkey, human, they are equal. Opinion, there's a, nothing about right or wrong, that's just different opinion, okay? So the sage, the, uh, the sages just amuse themselves with this variety of opinion but do not quarrel with them. So the simple standard to, uh, the, the, they simply stand at the, the center of the circle, a stronger call it, to meet the infinite variety. They let the different opinion alone and they themselves trans, transcend them. Okay. So the concept he want to use is so-called liang hang or liang xing, two calls at one. This one is on the, um, I think it's in chapter two, right? So the story is simple, basics talking about the monkey keeper. He gives the monkey in the uh, four uh, acron in the morning, uh, the three acron in the morning, four in the evening, and the monkey complain. So he decided to give uh, the uh, monkey uh, four acron in the morning and uh, three in the evening. So basics, he still give out seven every day, but monkey were happy. So he wants to use this example to say, actually three in the morning, four in the afternoon, four, four in the morning, three in the afternoon, they are the same, but people may sometimes happy with this one, sometimes not happy with this one. So. The ideal situation is let them exist both, you know. So he called this one uh, uh, two causes at once. So basically, he's talking about uh, the good and the bad. There's no such thing good and the bad. Different opinion, just let them exist together, just live as is. So I, I don't want we think about this one as um, kind of like find the golden mean in between compromise, okay? I think this one is, if you want to pick the concept in the Western philosophy, uh, I think the uh, sext, uh, sextus uh, imperacus, right? He talk about the suspension of uh, judgment, aporia, this kind of concept, you don't make a judgment, just let two concepts exist together. Don't see the difference. I think that's the way 
Zhuangzi try to explain, and especially he used the story of the monkey keeper to explain, you know, how he want to uh, talk about this concept. So I will stop for question, comment. Now, if you have anything to say. So next, I'm going to move to another one. Uh, since we already talked about um, uh, how to live, the political, how to live, and the foundation of uh, equality, so the next subject, right? Since we talk about big and the small, big bird, monkey, human, they are all the same, all right? So we move to the virtual, there's no good, no bad, no beautiful, no ugly. So next concept naturally come with is life and the death, right? So here, Zhuangzi start to talk about in the universe, nothing can be said superior to other. You don't say you are the king, I'm the servant. You don't say I'm the master, you are slave. That's all equal, okay? So they just had the different form of existence. And then, so there's no one is superior to the other one. In this case, the life is one form of existence. That simply means that we have to give up the, the form of existence and to assume another form. If the form is good, the life is good, there's no reason to suppose the other forms are bad. So after you die, you go to the different world or different form of existence. Since this form is good, you, you cannot say the next or uh, the, the one of the following choice are bad because we don't know. So why not just assume they are good? That's their concept of life and the death. So this concept has been put a lot in, especially in chapter six, the uh, great teacher, because on the first part, uh, they talk about death a lot. And John's also use a lot of story to talk about this. So basically, he talk about uh, to have attend to the human form is the source of a joy. But the infinite evolution, there are thousands of other form. They are equally good. What an incomparable bliss it is to undergo this countless uh, uh, transition. So you pass away, you, you just go to the different form. That's Zhuangzi I have to talk about. And here's another part I will put uh, this one. Okay, he bring up uh, Feng Yulan, they also like to bring up the uh, concept of uh, human bondage. And this one in chapter three, right? The story is, uh, let, me, let me talk about this story a little bit because the story is there's one guy uh, so called, uh, that's uh, Zhuangzi called the toeless guy. He has no toes. Yeah, usually during that time, if you commit some crime, and one of the punishment may be cut off your toes. So he went to see Confucius, toeless. Okay. He went to see Confucius because Confucius was a famous teacher. So Confucius said, Oh, well, you. You, you, you don't know how to behave yourself. That's why you commit a crime, got a punishment. So Tolis said, no, I'm not here to, 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 to confess that I made a mistake. You know, I heard that you are a great teacher. That's why I come here to see you. Then Confucius immediately realized, oh, I'm sorry. You know? And then, you know, uh, is there anything you want to learn from me or something like this? Then, uh, uh, then Confucius start to tell his disciple, say, look at this guy, the tallest guy. He know he made a mistake and he's still very brave to correct his own mistake and willing to learn. So you need to learn from these tallest people. So the tallest guy, very, very disappointed. 
right? Because why he's disappointed? Because he saw Confucius as a famous teacher, he still stick with this right and the wrong, right? In the Taoist point of view, there's nothing right and the wrong. And for him, he lost the toes. It's not a big deal. Okay? That's just part of my body. And the Confucius always focus on the government that give you the right thing, you violate, you do the wrong, wrong thing, you got the punishment. So this one, uh, 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 Fong Yulai call it a uh, human bondage. And uh, the Chinese word, they said that the common, they were considered the ancient, the man of God, that means the, uh, the, 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 the sage who were released from this bondage. And the bondage here is talking about is the uh, virtue, the government, the society, society imposed on everyone. Lots of the bondage. So you not only you want to release from the death, okay, you also want to release, relief from the society, the bondage society keep you, that means including social norm, rituals, and the virtues. Okay. So that's the way you can be freedom. That's the uh, concept in uh, 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 drunk. Any any other comment, question, or agree, disagree, or before I move to the next one? Yeah, I, I just want to say is I think it's very it's so interesting that the Confucius Tao and the Tao that we're talking about, I didn't realize they were so completely different. That there's there's like a the, the Tao is like the original version, I, I guess, from what I'm understanding, is just completely, there's no good, there's no bad. And then I guess Confucius is really, I mean, then correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, is very con concerned with harmonious living. So with that being said, there is kind of a good and a bad. There is a virtue. Was Confucius considered like, uh, uh, I mean, he's very much obviously well-respected, but was, was that considered like very almost outrageous and... Uh, like a uh, rebellious thinking in a way. Okay, that's a. I think your answer are all correct. What well, in my opinion? Okay, so uh, let's put it this way. This book, Zhuangzi, a lot of uh, writing is writing against Confucius' teaching. Confucius was two hundred years before him, so he has no chance to argue against Zhuangzi. Let's put it this way. But later part, because Chinese society faces dominate by Confucianism. So that's why Zhuangzi or Taoism is not that popular. And my, in my opinion, Confucius and the Zhuangzi are different. But again, you might find some people tell you they are the same. Okay, They may, from the story said, long time ago, when Confucius, Lao Zi, the founder of Taoism, so-called, and he was the teacher of Confucius. Confucius ex Laozi something. That's another story. They are from the same source. They should be the same. They are looking of a harmony. So we will talk about later uh, today. Okay, he was later in the uh, 10th, 11th century. The Neo Confucian, um, Neo Confucian is a movement, basically try to consolidate the Taoism thinking and the Confucianism thinking. So it's very complicated. And then uh, uh, what you hear today, it, you can view as just my opinion. And they probably have many, many different opinions around there. So thank you for mentioning it. Uh, Katie, please. Would it be accurate to say that there's no right or wrong, it just is? Would that be accurate? Uh, there's no right and wrong. Yeah, I, I will agree with you, you know, uh, in general, that's nothing right and wrong, that's, that's, it is. Just like my example, when I was young and the teacher said, oh, you should explore the world with unlimited resources. I thought that's right. But right now we all know it's wrong, but who knows, you know, uh, uh, 50 years later. So that's kind of my take on this kind of thing. So my action is 
anything, good or bad, just do it within the limit. So, <laughs> uh, Quang and Steve. Yeah, I think that the difference between the Tao of Confucianism and the Tao of Taoism is absolutely central to the Chinese uh, thought because uh, the Tao in Confucianism is truly related to uh, the political purposes of Confucianism. Okay, let's not forget the Confucianism of Ru Jia in Chinese has been created by the Zhou royal court. And when Confucius said that he did not invent anything, but he was only the humble transmitter of the cultural legacy of the Zhou kings or the kings of the dynasty of the Zhou dynasty, uh, he was perfectly right because uh, the uh, the aims and the purposes of the two branches of the scholars of ancient China was not at all the same because most of the philosophers who would be called later on in the West as Taoists, they were much more focused on personal development, if I may use that expression, for something having, happen, having happened 25 centuries ago, even 3000 years ago. Uh, and those scholars that we now a day call Confucianists and that the Chinese call the Ru, they were much more focused on political uh, sovereignty and on the epistemological development to develop, to, to create in themselves personal qualities that would make them worthy rulers or worthy state advisors. So uh, the motivation at the root were not the same at all. I stop here. Yeah, th thank you, Kwang, for this one. When you talk about worthy, right? Uh, so that's just like, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say he's right, I'm wrong, or Tao is right, so up to you, you can make decide, right? Confucius will say, make sure you are worthy, okay? In another way, you are useful. You are useful for this society, for the common good. Taoism, what is that say? That's dangerous to become useful, okay? If you are useful, then, then a lot of story, like a big tree, why the big tree can survive? Because it's totally useless. And for the good tree, grow fruit, people pick, you know, good timber, people cut it. So if you want to live long, be useless. That's Taoism thinking, and which I believe Confucius will not be happy about this. <laughs> okay, Steve, please. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say something very similar. I, I think Confucius was about governing in society and took the world view that for society to operate smoothly there is one sort of set of rules one one Tao that everyone should follow there that's how society works best whereas Taoism like you were saying Quan is is more much more individualistic and the world view is society and everything will work very well if everyone follows their own their own Tao, their own way through the universe. So it is, it's more individualistic. Yeah, thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, Karim, please. Uh, yeah, to, to this discussion, I would add that perhaps, and, and that's my opinion, uh, perhaps at the, at the very source of the, the, the original impulse for Confucianism and Taoism is the same uh, where you know everyone is able to identify what is good or what is best, but then the I think where they differ is what do you do with that and how much effort and sacrifice do you want to uh, spend to maintain the status quo? Because it's easy to agree on 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 what is good and make a decision. Yeah, you know it's probably fair to say that a, that a reasonable Taoist would say, yeah, you know what, this doing this is better than doing that because it's this is more natural. It's more like, you know, something that uh, belongs to a bird. So let's not make a bird into a human. So they would probably agree in the beginning, but then the it always, almost seems like Taoist kind of leaves it, leaves it at that for everybody to make their own conclusion and, and kind of live with their own nature. And Confucianism takes that almost in an artificial way, one one step further or a couple of steps further, and saying, "Oh no, let's let's just build a whole system because it's going to help our society." Yeah, and uh, that, thank you, Chris. Yeah, that's yeah. not necessarily right or wrong, but yeah, it, it's just a matter of perspective, I think. 
So put this way, in the uh, builds on Tuesday, we also in the Confucius uh, analytic reading. So that one, okay, on Tuesday, Confucius, we shall come with some consensus, we agree on something. So here is more open, okay, so basics, you know, more individualized. So how do you think that's up to you? Because based on Zhuangzi, there's no way I can judge, you know, you are right, you are wrong. Okay, so no one can judge each other. So just, uh, I, I think this is more fun in this way. So, <laughs> uh, uh, number six, talk about immortality. Okay, this one is not from Bong Yong. I, I put a purple, that's my view on that. I think that's important because Taoism, uh, all the philosophy will talk about kind of immortality, especially in the Western philosophy, like immortality of soul. But I just want to make sure uh, we just mentioned that Taoism thinking basic as no God. Okay. I'm not talking about relig a religious Tao. I'm talking about the philosophical Tao. Basically, no place for God. And they talk about immortality, but don't mix with Platonic or Christian immortality of soul. But it's a naturalistic view of life. Okay. So the idea is the immortality is not is without soul, okay, without the soul. So how do you how do they talk about Taoism talking about immortality okay, without talking about soul? That's the point here. Uh, Madeline, I see you have hands up, please. Yes, I just thought I would comment on this, if it's okay with you. Please, please. Yeah, I'd like um, to what do you say. Yeah. So, um, Feng Yolan, he, he, he makes a big effort to uh, correlate things in Taoism that people familiar with Western philosophy might understand. Yes. Um, this, this immortality is not one of them. Um, the concept of uh, immortality that has gone through Western civilization and the, you know, the big Judeo-Christian religions and everything. Uh, basically, the ancient Greeks, their idea of it, I think of it as being like a bucket that is filled with something. So uh, the body is filled with a soul or formal logic gets filled in with, with specific things. Um, so we have a whole world of sort of if you think of like a, a tin bucket filled with sand, okay, and the sand is the soul. Taoism is not about this bucket theory. It's not about substance and essence. It's not about, um, you know, I, I, the ideal and the real and all of that. It's very different from that. It's somewhat more like the pre-Socratics in that the, 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 the main thrust of it is um, a mixing of elements, a continual change. It can be fast, it can be slow, it can be big, it can be small, but this ongoing pivoting through of uh, different substances in the world and different energies kind of intertwining. So it's more of a process religion than an object religion, uh, the way that the Western religions are. Uh, thank you, Madeline. I, I think you said most of them, so thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the only thing I want to add is uh, chapter three, when Zhuangzi talk about the famous uh, story about the Kuk Ding, okay? and at the very end, he talk about our existence is like a fire. Through the present, fuel is consumed. The fire is transmitted, and we know not when it's come to the end. That means it's endless, it's immortality. So basic, just like, think about just like a fire, right? You, 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 the fuel or the candle will burn out, but the fire can continue on, you know, uh, endless. So that's the concept of immortality. Uh, another way I see it's similar to Hinduism. It's like a Brahman, right? I think one of the story talk about the, well, we are just a drop of the water. So the water go to the ocean or same as the clay, 
you can make a cup, like a porcelain, like a china, and then when you break it, then you go back to the earth. So nature this kind of you know, nature this type of immortality. So since I'm when I die, my part will become you know fertilizer for the tree, and the tree continue to live. That's kind of concept of immortality. So so here we do the concept and the seven, eight, nine, and the ten. Basically, that's a, a formula when to talk about his own philosophy, his view on this one. So it, you may not, it, I think it's the first one, two, six, probably uh, everyone will say this way. Okay, uh, anyone read thousand will say this one. From seven going on, that's just uh, formula in the opinion. Some you agree, some you may disagree. I think that's totally fine. So, yeah. so number seven, he talked about pure experience. Basics, he is followed by William James, um, uh, a posthumous uh, 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 published uh, book called uh, uh, Essays in Radical Empiricism in 1912. Okay. So over there, you know, basics, he, uh, I, I, put, I just kind of copy from the uh, Stanford University, uh, Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, I have to talk about this paper. Uh, it's a little bit long, I didn't read it. <clears throat> Basically, he talked about the concept of pure experience. And what William James tried to resolve is the mind, body, or people, uh, a spiritual matter problem, because, uh, you know, in Western tradition, we have a two school. One is from Kent, talk about uh, a, a, a priori knowledge. You always have innate knowledge before you know the world. In the British side, you talk about empiricism or typical rasa, right? You, you like a blank slate, you receive what you get. He tried to resolve this one, uh, William James. He talked about uh, pure experience. That means it's neither mental, neither physical. Okay, so that's the foundation of what we have. Okay, so he used the example the perception of a chair. When you see a chair, you cannot just see the chair as a chair. You cannot stop thinking about the people sitting there, the function for the people. So before, so it's a priori knowledge or empirical, you know, habitual habitual rasa, we don't know. But uh, William James want to call it a pure experience. Okay, that's the part uh, Fong Yulan try to bring up. So that's just uh, my summary of uh, William James' philosophy. And then Fong Yulan want to talk about is. The all knowledge is originated from the pure experience, mental and physical. This one from William James. So Taoism basics disparage the uh, disparage the knowledge because knowledge makes distinction, while pure experience, pure experience, pure experience excluded. So one way you can say I I I add a priori knowledge. Okay, so Taoism look down the bias knowledge or you prejudgmental basics. You they want to you a uh, Taoism want you to receive knowledge without preconcept. I think that's the key. And the input the concept here you talk about bin and the pillow. They are identical. They just one big piece of wood, right? You put in horizontal, you call it the beam because you, you try to support the roof. But if you put the vertical, you call it the pillar or call it a, 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 a column. They are identical, ugly, and beautiful. Okay, they are the same. You know, some 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 uh, they, uh, some girl or man you see it's beautiful, but the other person will say ugly. But we all know, you know, the aesthetic. The concept of beauty change through the history. So the what is great greatness, weakness, 
uh, perverseness, strangeness, they all relative, not only relative, is no fixed concept on that. So uh, a lot she tried to bring up. So another one is they say it's no important thing is there's no separation of things. To say nothing of distinguish between subject and object, between the me and the non-me. Okay. So in the state of experience, there's nothing but what? The whole. So there's no subject, no object, no me, no non-me. So me and the non-me, this concept, I believe they will be very close to the Buddhism thinking. But uh, again, here he mentioned about the subject object. And that's why he bring to uh, bring the within James pure experience. And personally, I will suggest what well, that's my 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 theory is similar to Martin Buber. Okay, if you're familiar with his theology, he talk about I and Tao. He talk about the thing. Uh, but basically, he's not talking about the world view. He's more talking about the religion, how to know God. So he's talking about you don't know God through the relation of I, it. It should be I, thou, this kind of concept. So I, I feel this one has the similar way of what Taoism is talking about. So that, that's I want to provide for you. So that's just a thought about uh, how do we know things, right? So uh, <clears throat> that uh, from your line think Taoism thinking is similar or very close to uh, William James pure experience. So we have uh, Richard and others. Richard, please. Uh, first of all, can I make a suggestion, Jason, that yeah. for next time, um, because your voice, we can hear your voice, we can hear what you're saying, but it's just a little bit low. Oh, and thank you. maybe if so how you about can now? use, it's better. Yeah, it's better, it's okay. better okay. when, like, that's what I was going to suggest, getting oh, closer to you. the mic. Yeah, so that it's more clear so we can hear you better. Thank you. But it's okay the way it is, but it's just, it's, I forgot my volume all the way up, and sometimes I miss certain things. So um, it would be nice. So anyway, um, yes. So, are we aware that it is the I, the me, the self, that is inventing the illusion of division and separation? And are we aware that we're under a delusion that we cannot live without it? We, that's why the brain body is clinging to the idea of an I, a me, a self. So can we snap out of it? Can the brain snap out of the hallucination, the dream world, right? And wake up to freedom. And then freedom can do the thinking, which then becomes coherent, rational, sane, holistic action. So, because otherwise, the brain body is trapped in illusion making. So you never see the bird, the cloud, the tree, your children. You never listen to music. You never taste broccoli. You don't know what it is, right? So, so what will, in other words, the question is what will free the brain, right? The brain wants freedom. The brain needs freedom in order to function healthfully. So can it, so what will help the brain to break out of the prison? of words, ideas, concepts, all these abstractions. Like we read all this, right? The, the Tao, right? And we say, I understand, right? Mental, mentally, but we're not living it in our daily life, right? So maybe partially, maybe, you know, a little bit here and there. But so what will make us actually live it? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, 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 thank you, Richard. And uh, then I, I think that we will cover on the, uh, the tenth point. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we will cover this part. And thank you for sharing how you think. And I, of course, I don't have a fixed answer, but that's a big question we all have to ask. Uh, Alex, please. 
Um, my question is this pure experience, do you have the Chinese translation for this? So I no. can better understand. No, because this one pure ex uh, pure experience is uh, from William James. Okay. So okay. Okay, so that's that's why I say seven, eight, nine, and the ten. That's uh Feng Yolan, he he based as a Western, uh, he studied Western philosophy. And when he after he translated the Duanzi, he kind of like thinking about okay, that's the point the Western philosopher talking about. He bring up William James, he bring up Spinoza a lot, and that's what he wanted to talk about. Yeah, and I'm I'm quite confused about this one because you know first it says you know because knowledge makes distinctions while pure experience ex excludes it. Um, but what about collective experience? I mean, if if yeah, he probably if you see does. an elephant. If you see it, if if if, it, if there's an elephant in the room and everybody says there's an elephant. You know, uh, uh, it, for, for Taoism, you you can refer that as something else, or you you don't have to believe it. Um, also, second thing is, what about right and wrong? If somebody kills someone that you love or your your family, uh, do you not even make a distinct? distinction um i'm so sorry i'm just a little bit confused thank you yeah yeah i think so that's a uh, uh it's fine you know we all confused on this one and that's the perennial question nobody knows how to answer what's right what's wrong and that's and uh, actually that's what Zhuangzi or Taoism philosopher try to talk about and basically you see an elephant then you should not yeah, have but, a judgment on the elephant yeah but 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 you see I think it leads to chaos in society. That's let's the say comment. let's say you know you know there's a war going on and you you're not you don't know you can you can make the distinction of you know who is right or wrong or whatever going on in society you just go along as as you wish and everyone if everyone does that I think the the society will become kind of chaos. I mean, it would be like a free thinking, you know, free, nobody's right, nobody's wrong. But if somebody really does something bad, like killing someone else, like, you know, um, you don't make a distinction about that. Uh, yeah, I of, of course, I, I totally agree on what you are talking about. You need to do right and wrong. But Taoism will argue the other way. The chaos was caused by the right and wrong, right? That's they are going to argue. I think your argument is valid. So if you don't know right and wrong, I hit you, you kill that guy, uh, you gotta have a right and wrong. But the Taoism argument, that right and wrong cause the war. Right and wrong cause the argument. So uh, of course that's a circular argument. <laughs> we probably don't Thank have you, that's very interesting, thank you. So the common, common, common argument is, you know, these, these people, they live in the warring state. They see China during the time, a lot of war. Okay, Confu make it simple. Confucian thinking would be, okay, we need to have the right and the wrong. That's the right thing, that's the wrong thing. What's the right thing? The ancient China, ancient time, they have the right thing. Or eat something before we go? So uh, Taoism thinking about, because uh, you, you keep talking about right and the wrong. That's why, you know, people always think they are right and other people are wrong. That's why you have a problem. So yeah. I think that's the Yeah, I think it sounds it sounds like a very detached um yeah. view. So I, I, we we have no way to resolve the question because it's already been many, many years, uh, thousand years, and not only in China, also in any place in this world. But that's a philosopher story. <laughs> You know, we can talk about anything without taking any responsibility. That's the good thing. Uh, Amethyst, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jason. I wanted to address um, a question that had been raised earlier about what seems to be such a contrast between Taoism and Confucianism. 
Mm-hmm. I had I had come across a section in a book that that really illuminated it for me, and I thought other people might find it helpful. It's in the introduction, in the Roger Ames translation of Sun Tzu, uh, with the Art of Warfare. Uh, mm-hmm. So he says, um, I put this. So he says that um, in the world of classical China. Instead of starting abstractly from some underlying uniform, unifying and originating principle, in other words, like God, we begin from our own specific place in the world. Without objectivity, objects dissolve into the flux and flow and existence becomes a continuous uninterrupted process. Each of us is invariably experienced in the world as one perspective within the context of many. Um, so one interprets the world, the order of the world around one as contrastive, this is and that's, this person and that person, more or less proximate to oneself. So all human relationships are continuous from ruler and subject to friend and friend, relating everyone as an extended family, in quotation marks. Similarly, all things, like all members of a family, are correlated and interdependent. Everything is what it is at the pleasure of everything else. Um, I'm just going to skip through. There is no essential defining feature, no divinely endowed soul, rational capacity, or natural locus of rights. So this is Western philosophy that makes all human beings equal. In the absence of such equality that would make us essentially the same, The various relationships that define one thing in relation to another tend to be hierarchical and contrastive. It sounds a lot like Confucianism. More noble or more base, harder or softer, stronger or weaker, more senior or more junior. So now we're back in Taoism. Change in the quality of relationships between things always occurs on a continuum as movement between such polar opposites. And the general and most basic language for articulating such correlations among things is metaphorical. Uh, so I won't I won't keep going, but um, I found it, it really helped me to understand the link between Taoism and Confucianism. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And that would be, very interesting. Okay, so I think uh, that that it is more like myself. Okay, personal. I understand Taoism through what is not Confucius, and I understand Confucius through what not from the criticize of Taoism. Thinking. So uh, uh, we we all have a different way to understand it. And thank you for sharing uh, this text, uh, Joe Christie. Um, just a point of clarification. I just was curious to know, um, on the one slide, it was knowledge breaks things up into parts. Uh, and you just had it up. And I was wondering if that's in Taoism something that's similar to the I-it relationship. And then the experience would be more the I-thou relationship. Yeah, as far as is that is that a good, is that a way of thinking about I, it? I, I would think about just up, I would say Taoism thinking with more is the I love relationship. So, right, it's an experience, right? So the idea of it, so yeah. so the experience is an I thou, yeah. whereas the knowledge that you had on the one slide uh, that you just had up, that's the I it. That's right. Because so that because you're automatically just looking at what is factually in front of you as opposed to actually understanding like yeah okay i i just wanted to point it from that yeah thank you okay uh kwang please okay so i would like to introduce something that is according to my understanding is the relationship between confucianism and taoism because and maybe i don't have the pretensions to say that my answer would cover all forms of Taoism, but only the kind of philosophical Taoism that we are speaking today with Zhuangzi. 
let's not forget that Chuang Tzu is, was a scholar that was at the apex of the scholarly tradition in China uh, 24 centuries ago. What do I mean by that? I mean that at the beginning of his life, he was studying the cultural tradition of his country, the scholarly tradition of uh, the scholars of his time. And he was uh, creating that book called the Chuang Tzu, which for me is the apex of the scholarly tradition. What do I mean? If we go back to the paragraph 2.4 of the Analects by Confucius, he was exp explaining in six steps the evolution of the mind of someone, okay? And at, at the fourth step, he would say that uh, at 50 years old, I'm capable to hear the will of heaven. At, at 60 years old, I'm capable to hear the, the will of heaven without complaining. And at 70 years old, I'm capable to do what I want without overstepping the universal laws. The, the, sixth, uh, the fifth and the sixth lines evokes tremendously uh, Taoist principles. What do I mean by that? This kind of philosophical Taoism is like the apex of the Confucianist epistemological development, meaning that there's no wrong, there's no right, there's no ugly, uh, there's no ugliness, there's no beauty. Well, uh, you get to that kind of attitude in life when you are at the apex of your personal growth and of your epistemological development, meaning if I go, want to go back to Confucius, the line five and the line six of par paragraph uh, 2.4, okay? I hear the will of heaven without complaining. I, I can do what I want without overstepping the universal laws. So for me, philosophical Taoism, okay? I'm not speaking of all Taoism. Philosophical Taoism, the Taoism which has been created by the scholars is simply the supreme achievement of Confucianism. I stop here. Yeah, thank you, Kwang. Okay, so first uh, you promote the Confucianism. So Taoism is the highest achievement of Confucianism. Okay, uh, and that's exactly I want to put on the, this uh, eight point, uh, activity and uh, tranquility. Okay, so uh, yeah, of course then on the surface, okay, I'm not saying I totally agree with uh, Kwang. I, I, we can have like another three hours argument on this one, but let's stop here. Uh, 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 Kwang makes a really a good point, right? If you take a Confucius point of view, the different level of understanding to Confucius to the certain uh, 50 years old, you know the main then of the heaven. The 60 years old, everything is, well, depend on how you interpret. 70 years old, you can do everything as I want, never make mistake. So that's the, hard, the, the situation of Taoism talking about, Zhuangzi talking about, no, nothing right and the wrong. High, that's the highest one. Same thing, okay, here we talk about this one. Uh, we talk about activity and the tranquility. This one basis has been focused on the near Confucian, right, on the 1100 AD. So they try to consolidate uh, Confucianism and the Taoism. And it's just like exactly what Quan just talking about. Basics, the Taoism, Confucius is the highest point of Taoism uh, uh, philosophy. So uh, that's the, the, the metaphysical start to develop. So in this point of view, Quan is absolutely right if you take the 11, Hundred this moment that's the achievement. But if we talk about Zhuangzi, the book itself, Zhuangzi is probably will not agree with Quan uh, 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 during that time. But in the eleven hundreds time, uh, that's the time Confucius and the Zhuang Zhuangzi they kind of like uh, talking about the same thing here. So here, uh, I I try to finish uh, the other three slides. Okay. Uh, so we will cover everything. So that's the activity and tranquility. You will see these two things are opposite, but they try to put activity within tranquility. So th this one is the high point in Chinese philosophy. They try to combine the thousand thinking 
uh, Confucian thinking and plus the flavor of Buddhism philosophy. So we 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 will talk about this one, and then we, I have been talking this one for I think for a, a few times on this subject that neo Confucians. I will quickly go through the rest, um, then we will have uh, some time to discuss uh, freedom. I think uh, you mentioned about Richard mentioned about uh, brand freedom. So I would like to everyone to think about this situation. And I think that's very important, but not being focused in Chinese tradition. It's about freedom, absolute freedom. Uh, Zhuangzi's philosophy, just like Richard just mentioned, th this world and the, you have a brain, but you live in this world, you are small compared to the entire nature, but actually you are free. Okay. Basics is your He's talking about you are independent from outside. So you contain. That's key, is freedom. That's the point he's talking about. So since you talk about freedom, you talk content. I think number 10 is a very important. Also, uh, uh, also uninfluenceable. OK, thank you. Also uninfluenceable. So number 10. Immovable. Immovable, OK, yeah. So uh, when we talk about freedom, right? So we talk about uh, uh, here, I think uh, 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 Hong Yolan bring up a very important point. And then when I talk about Zhuangzi, uh, uh, a lot of people ask about the, the content, right? So the example is, I'm poor. I don't jealous the rich people. I just live whatever I have. And if I'm the, being suppressed, I just follow the rule. I pursue the happiness myself. No, the answer is no. Uh, Zhuangzi is not talking about this. And then uh, uh, Fong Yolan quote a paper from Bertrand Russell. He calls it uh, a free man's worship. And then uh, uh, Russell, this paper, Bertrand Russell, Talk, this paper basics talking about how do we behave virtually, freely, without war, without God. Because during that time, the early 20th century, uh, basics, uh, most of people don't believe God, the real existence of God. And uh, he want to talk about, Bertrand Russell want to talk about how to live in this world without God. And here he talking about the oriental subjection. So. Fong Yolan, I put blue here, he make it very clear. This one is a seeming passivity of Taoism. It's not oriental subjection. That means it's not I contend what I have and I don't complain. Basically, he's talking about emancipation. It's a free man's worship. That's a, 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 a Bertrand Russell is talking about. And then uh, uh, Fong Yolan like to mention another thing is uh, uh, Spinoza. Uh, think about Spinoza's worldview and uh, Zhuangzi or Taoism's worldview. They all think about naturalistic. They all believe if this world is deterministic. But how can we live in this deterministic world and still free? So Fong Yolan's uh, common is here. He talking about this uh, philosophy with the equality of things. Thinking the you can the infinite can be expressed in the finite world. Uh, the concept of infinity, uh, in infinity can be expressed in the finite. The eternal expressed in the temple. Okay, so I think that's he. Uh, work about the freedom and about this worldview of Taoism worldview. So uh, I would draw the final conclusion. I think that's a clean talk about Hegel. Uh, uh, I think it's here. Uh, I think that's very important. And then uh, uh, Hong Yolan also talked about 
庄子 doesn't make it clear on this point because when we talk about back to nature, okay, we mix about two things. So that's why for your like quote uh, Hegel about the harmoniousness, okay, from the childhood, it's the first harmony, but there is a second harmony. You need some effort, some practice to achieve. Even they are the same, but you need some effort to achieve the second harmony. I think that's what Feng Yu and I want to talk about. And I do agree, I very agree on this part, because just like uh, when Zhuang Zi talk about knowledge, talk about doing without beyond your, uh, beyond your capability, knowing don't go beyond what you need to know. It, doesn't mean you are a baby, you are a child, you don't learn anything, that's all I can do. I think he is talking about is the second harmony. It looked like you are going back to your childhood, but actually this going back to childhood is through some effort, okay? through some philosophical thinking, that you can go back to childhood. We all remember, most of people probably all think, the childhood life, back to uh, childhood life, is happy. Okay. I, I assume most of people have a happy, uh, I, I do, but you know, most of people, I assume. So uh, I want to be happy, go back to childhood. It, because I already grow, I get in old, but I need some effort to achieve the second harmonious, which is not which is nature, but you have to go back with some effort. So uh, I think I will stop here. I'm sorry to over time a little bit. Okay, so uh, then uh, that that does extend for fifteen minutes, so we can have some discussion. So the, don't forget the next week, Kwang is going to talk about uh, Chinese history, and of course we will have some philosophy running into uh, this discussion. And, Okay, let's open some questions. I will have Alex and then Robert. Um, actually, I, I actually want to bring in this big picture, um, add on to everything that we talk about. Um, okay. The big picture of Taoism, the very first line says, Dao ke dao, fei chang dao. And I want to refer this, which means, you know, the way things are is works in a mysterious ways. And I want to refer to, uh, I, I'm actually surprised Feng Yulan did not mention Wittgenstein. Uh, okay. Because because, <laughs> because the limits of, of my language means the limits of my world. And that is actually a major uh, concept in Taoism. As in the first line, it says, Everything works in a mysterious ways, and because of its the the and also thousand talk about talks about the limitation of language, and therefore, anyone who tries to like explain anything, I mean, of course, we know we're discussing right now, but it's just the 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 concept of thousand is is so that because things are in a mysterious way, and there's no way that we can actually understand how everything works, you know, experience, the world, our life, um, it would be wrong. It would be kind of wrong. I would, maybe it's not wrong, but it would be kind of a mistake or kind of waste of time to try to define everything to its core because, you know, the, the Tao is in a mysterious way and that no one really knows. And with the limitation of the language, you know, just by translating Zhuangzi to English, already has its limitations, right? So I really want to bring this big picture, kind of like, you know, the big background of Taoism to share with everyone that just be careful, um, you know, and keep that in mind that this this not really, you know, that's a big, big part of Taoism that it recognizes the limitation of language and that language and our experience cannot be fully uh, expressed or, yeah, uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, uh, well, nothing to agree or disagree, but I just want to uh, have some uh, defend for Feng Yulai. First, uh, this book is written based on uh, 
Zhuangzi, this book. And the Zhuangzi and the Laozi, Dao De Jing, has some subtle difference. So uh, that's why he didn't paint the big picture. He said, the Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chang Dao, the Dao can be said, it's not a constant Dao. The name can be named, it's not a real name. So uh, that's the reason he limited on the Zhuangzi thinking. We can start, of course, he, I think that you you make a very good point, and the, and when Hong Yolan study, he I know he start. You you will see the person he quote. He like to quote Spinoza. He like quote William James a lot because mm -hmm. he is study from Colombia with Jiang Dui. Okay. <laughs> uh, pragmatism, American philosophy. So that's a little bit. I see. Okay. They are not, and yeah. So I think that's the reason. Okay, but, but I, I see I see some relations with Wittgenstein and Zhuangzi and a lot, yeah. Yeah, that's depend on how you read it. And some people will say the Heidegger, you know, uh, do, doing a yeah. lot related to uh, allowed. And in a way, you can see it, it's always unfair to say, oh, uh, Zhuangzi say something is exactly what Spinoza say something. Or right. Not the right thing to say, but. Uh, it's it's proper way the the way I bring it. Other philosopher, especially Western philosopher, is the way try to help people understand right. or help myself understand what right. Zhuangzi is saying. There's no way to say Zhuangzi is the same. He said this one freedom is the same as Spinoza talk about it. I only can say. Uh, if you think about Spinoza's freedom, that could be in the same flavor to understand what Zhuangzi talk about freedom. Right, right. Anyway, I, I actually, I, I actually think more about Wittgenstein because the limitation of language and the experience. Okay. Yeah, Thank that's you. right, and then that's the purpose of this meetup because uh, I think so we should generate more question than answer more. But that's the purpose. Uh, we have a uh, Robert and a Steve. Robert, please. Um, yeah, first I want to say thank you very much. That was awesome. It was super cool. I'm, I'm glad I got uh, to listen to this beginning uh, intro because I feel like I'd be very lost if I if I missed this. Um, I, you I can should... continue to study the seven chapter by yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think so. I like this idea of the, the second harmony because it seems like the second harmony is basically just unlearning everything because you have that you're given that first harmony. <laughs> so the, that pursuit of labor, that labor in, of the spirit is just basically unlearning everything <laughs> and kind of returning to that first harmony. Yeah, it sounds um, like Zhuangzi or Taoism philosophy, the Chinese didn't talk about this. Okay, they just kind of assume, you know, you know. So I think so that's a good point. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, I also was thinking, because it seems like the original Tao is very like, um, because all, all we can experience is, is ourselves. And so it's very um, uh, concerned with the individual, right? Because that's all you can really, that's all you can really do is to live within your, to, or your, your, your Tao and li live in as true as you, as you can to your nature. Um, I wonder um, if it's ever been compared in a way, this is a really weird comparison, but like to like a view of Ayn Rand's kind of like, um, cause Ayn Rand is like, it's all that like selfishness and, and your, your, your desires are good. Um, which seems like almost like a dark, like a dark side of, <laughs> of Tao is, is, do you see like an interesting comparison there? Is, is that yeah. resonating yeah, anyway? Well, I, I think a lot of time I would call it a, a straw man's argument because you will say, okay, see you do this one, you are selfish. You do take this up, you can do this way. Okay. But of course, that's uh, a, a, a way you can think this way. But another way you can think about is you, you, you respect your own desire. Okay, everyone like you. I don't know. You know, everybody want to show the beautiful picture on the Facebook. Okay, I, I don't want to do it. Okay, and every so something like this. But of course, through the years. You know, people argue. And there's one thing, historical, well, there's some scholar talking about this one. Um, uh, I don't want to bring too much, but basics is Zhuangzi is another philosopher. So the same person okay, called Yang Zhu. 
okay, who is talking about taking over myself, then the world will be peaceful, something like this. I don't want that. It's very controversial, but it's really had some scholar talking about this. So they started from if everyone taking care of themselves, okay, everyone taking care of myself, mind your own business. This world will be peace, be peaceful. Okay. Don't okay. So don't interfere other people, tell people that's the wrong thing, do the right thing. So it, it's constantly uh I have the debate on this one. Again, my point is since we all talk, we don't do real things. So be free to think about what you think that's a real idea because nothing going to change. So <laughs> I, I totally agree with what you're saying too. I just I just was wondering if like playing devil's yeah, yeah, advocate. I, think that I, I like this uh, environmental because we can talk this one and then as long as we are respectable, um, we just enjoy the time. And after time up, we go back to our regular weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Forget about these things. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. But anyway, thank you. And we have a pretty good discussion. Then we have uh, Steve, please. Yeah, yeah I have a uh language or a, a language question at least okay um you. so you got me thinking about the title uh Tao Te Ching and okay so now that I'm making the connection that the du is the same du so I have a concept a definition for Tao I have a concept a definition for du I know there's a concept Ching though I honestly I don't think I know what the definition is I wouldn't mind you defining that for me but my question is the title is it a list of three things, or in Chinese, does that make a sentence? Does that, you know, what is the, what is the title Dao Te Ching mean? Means that means Jing means the book or classic book. Okay, so that means the book talking about Dao and the De. Okay, so okay. you know the Chinese, and then usually the Chinese book title doesn't have much meaning. If you read the analects, you will find out even funny. Each chapter they just pick up the first. Two words. Okay, so uh, uh, probably Chinese traditional Chinese is not a, a title is essentially a list of the things I'm about to talk about. Yeah, yeah, but but it, it, it not care because it, but today we may think about find a sexy title so we know what's going on because that's a business thinking. But I believe during that time, uh, uh, probably people don't think this way. So just I very interesting. Um, yeah, so that's just my opinion, but you know. Oh. Um, yeah, because if you read the analect, you will find out even funny because they that each chapter they have the title. You don't pick up the essence, what's the most important or most uh, uh, a shocking message. No, they just pick up the first two words. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, uh, CK, please. I think historically, uh, the significance of Taoism belongs in the category of being one of the three main strands of uh, thought that yeah. influence uh, Chinese intellectuals, administrators, governors, and uh, scholars. Mm -hmm. The three strands being Confucianism, Taoism, and lastly, Buddhism. So um, to quote Karl Marx, Religion is the opiate of the people, but it is also the sigh of the oppressed masses. So in the case of Taoism, let's take the religious religion part away. It is it acts in historically as the sigh of the oppressed intellectuals or the oppressed scholars or the oppressed administrators who did not get their way or did not have a, the chance to uh, adopt their Confucianist uh, strand to govern or to better society. So when they are not as successful, Taoism serves as a palliative to uh, assuage their egos or their, um, their unfulfilled ideals. So it, it, the, the significance of Taoism in one way can be looked at from that perspective. Um, that's just what I uh, was thinking about. Yeah, I know you think about, and probably most of the people may think about this way, 
And another way to talk about is the Monday to Friday, the weekday is Confucianism, and the weekend is Taoism. Uh, personally, I totally against this concept because uh, I don't see this way. I think the Taoism is a very positive view and a very uh, freedom. Uh, because uh, of course, I, I'm, we, we, we try not to uh, argue on who is right, who is wrong. I just want to express uh, majority will agree CK's point of view, and that's a lot of scholars talk about this. And personally, Jason, uh, I disagree on this one because I think Taoism uh, is, is not doing it the weekend. In other words, I would prefer five day working as Taoism and two day work as Confucianism. And I would prefer when I was sus successful and I still pra practice Taoism. That's my point. Of view. Uh, Kwang and Alex, and we probably need to finish the session. Anyway, okay. uh, thank you very much. And uh, the, we have a lot of uh, disagreement, and uh, the, that's the essence of Taoism. So, uh, Kwang, please. Well, I think that uh, CK and Jason uh, gave very interesting answers about the positions of Taoism. Okay, Because once again, I repeat myself, I still think that Taoism is a product of scholars, okay? So the scholars in general in ancient China as a group, they were not an oppressed group as a group, okay? They were at the top of the society. And I agree the fact, and I still maintain my general idea that a true philosophical Taoism is the supreme achievement of Confucianism. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that I would say it in a funny way, okay? It's like the relation between capitalism and socialism, okay? You cannot get social, socialism if you are not capable to make money, meaning you have to start by capitalism. So uh, you have to start by simple things in Confucianism and at the end of your pathway, you will be capable to hear the will of heaven, the will of heaven without complaining and doing what you want without overstepping the universal laws. But I would say that it's true that for those who did not reach to the, the high epistemological levels, ta Taoism has been wrongly used as a kind of consolation in case of failures. But I would agree to say that it's not the true uh, uh, goal of Taoism. The true goal of Taoism is really to go to, I can do what I want without overstepping on the universal laws, but on, sadly, it also has been used as a kind of consolation. I stopped here. Okay, thank you very much. Right now, uh, everyone will have three different opinions on Taoism. So, uh, that's so good. we will have no, the, I, actually, the final judgment. Actually, I, I have been thinking about the same question uh, since I was reading the the Tao of Pooh. Actually, it's a great book, and I, I can simplify this in 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 in, in a very simple way. Confucianism is how Chinese people organize our relationships with others, okay? With your father, with your superior, and such. Taoism is your attitudes about life. Would you agree with that, Jason? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and that's it, that's all I have to say. And then one last thing about Buddhism, Buddhism, is a human spirituality because every human being should have a spiritual calling because we every day we you know we we constantly ask ourselves where we come from and and buddhism is the kind of like the answer in the chinese society that um that that gives the spirituality you know when you have a spiritual calling that's you know that's that's what it is. so it's it's quite clear and simple that's my okay great uh well uh we uh we need to uh, stop here and then the best is to leave the question open and then that would be uh great so we can continue to discuss and uh, during the discuss debate disagreement uh, we all improve ourselves i believe you know. uh ck you have hands up i have you have a last word and uh, you can talk a little bit about what you want to talk about the uh, 
Oh, yeah, I was just saying, thinking about this uh, question. To agree to disagree is the mark of a gentleman, <laughs> uh, whether you are Confucian or not. But to agree to disagree is yeah. a yeah. mark of a distinction. Um, <clears throat> regarding what I'm going to talk about uh, on December 16, I'm trying whether the, the, the attempt will succeed or not depends on, uh, on, on pure luck to uh, present the travails of a eccentric, interesting intellectual uh, of the mid 19th century and early 20th century by the name of uh, Mr. Gu Hongming. Uh, he has a lot to, uh, well, he, he is interesting to me because of his uh, eccentricities and because of uh, what he uh, demonstrates as uh, what he thought was a superior Chinese civilization to the rest of vis-a-vis uh, -vis Western civilization. Uh, he has some ability and some uh, merit to what he's saying because he has been educated completely in the West. And uh, he's really a, a Western educated intellectual who later on uh, decided to become Chinese. So that, that itself is an interesting uh, odyssey, which I thought uh, may, may be uh, of some interest to the audience here. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, uh, yeah, I, I think I read some of his uh, translation, right? He did a, a few uh, translation, right? On the, uh, uh, yeah, okay, and we, we talk about this one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you everyone, and then, uh, we will uh, see you next week. And the Kwang we're talking about. Uh, Thank you very much. Very enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Thank you, Jason. See you next Thank week. You. This was great. Bye. Thanks. All right.